The assumption in Africanization is that appearance matters, and of course it does. But over and above appearance is the idea of content, the idea of socialization. What if we take the human, the uh, human beings and color as an envelope? <laughs> Uh, then you are more in. Uh, while the envelope matters, it is also very important to ask questions about the contents of ev any particular envelope. And it's not out of the question that an envelope that might appear African could actually con have contents that are uh, uh, very distant from, from the predicaments, the preoccupations of Africans. So uh, uh, the cultural context that one grows up in, African or not, matters a great deal in what we finally end up with as people who are sensitive to the predicaments of those where university institutions are located and uh, are able to draw um, meaningfully on the lived realities of those people. You have to be inserted within, within that world and not simply be, look like that world. You have to act like the world. So content matters and content comes through socialization. The university must reflect the context in which it operates. And a context like South Africa's context is a very complex uh, context uh, through its histories, through its uh, configurations. And uh, the need, therefore, for a nuanced approach that requires a careful reflection of this uh, uh, kaleidoscope, <laughs> if you might want to call it uh, that. And, and it, 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 it therefore implies that any uh, knowledge produced uh, curriculum within the university or curricula have to reflect the interests of these different stakeholders, some of which whom might not be within the university, some of whom might represent traditions of knowledge production that are hemmed out of the university because of the elitist nature and also because of the very uh, 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 how would you call it because of the very um, uh, imperial nature, yeah, imperial nature of the knowledge that we produce, uh, and 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 we need uh, to uh, 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 focus our attention in that if we have to be meaningful, relevant, and not just be an ivory tower in, in inserted in a given African community, we need to see how to conduct in conversations with parallel universes and parallel traditions of knowledge production by bringing them into the academy. Yeah. An academic has got to be conscious, again, of the context in which they, uh, they, they, they conduct uh, uh, the, the, the academy. And, and, and to be able to do, you have to, uh, for, I, I like using the word, to be intellectually nimble-footed which uh, requires a certain sensitivity uh, 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 to, to the world out there that needs the products of the university, that feeds the university and feeds from the university. So if an academic uh, uh, at UCT privileges uh, the suburbs and uh, lives an, a, a, a cocooned life in those and only uses the townships as a, a, a poaching ground for uh, validation of uh, uh, ideas that uh, are, are not a reflection of, 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 of the currency of life in, 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 in those settings, it is unfortunate. The title is Drinking from the Cosmic Gourd how Amos Tutola can change our minds. And I wrote it uh, Im immediately after uh, the Roads Must Fall events in, in 2015 uh, and the extension into Feast Must Fall in 2016. I felt that there were burning questions raised by students through these uh, movements. One of them was clearly that uh, students from uh, different backgrounds, uh, mostly non-white uh, 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 backgrounds in South Africa, 
or non-European background found themselves in institutions that did not capture the nuanced complexities of the world they came from. So they read books, they had curricula, but they didn't feel as if it was sufficiently representative of the, the complexities of their lives as South Africans. And uh, that for me posed a, 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 an epistemological problem. And, and it was an epistemological uh, problem that we had already noticed elsewhere in Africa where decolonization has been a much longer fight since the 60s. And the, the idea that uh, the university, tr the, the tradition of knowledge production privileged by the university is just one amongst others. And the case of Africa, it's even a very narrowly elitist one. Of course, it's elitist in every society, but even more so in a society that is uh, conquered through uh, uh, colonialism and imposed systems of values in the education. And uh, this was been, how would an African scholar, even as an elite scholar, conceptualize the world and research it and teach it and publish on it, informed by an African outlook of the world. And then I started looking at, at people who had set out to document this particular African perspective. And I said, I would deliberately go to people who did not have a foothold in the academy, who were chastised by the academy, who were even accused of not qualifying to write because they didn't have the colonial, the mastery of the colonial language to write. And the person who stood out for me in this regard was Amos Tutwala, uh, the, the, the late Nigerian uh, uh, writer uh, uh, um, uh, who published in 1952 uh, a book titled The Palm Wine Drinkard and followed up by a second book in 1954, uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. And now, quite ironically, uh, these books were published by a leading publisher in the metropolis in London, uh, Faber and Faber. Faber and Faber is tall on their achievements as a publisher. So they were, uh, uh, they were books that could not be ignored. They were not books published in an African setting as we have the, the, the habit of ignoring local publishers and validating international pub publishers uh, for our credentialism. So it was very interesting to go back into Amos Tutuola and see how the world he was trying to articulate. And for me, what stood out was the fact that Amos Tutuola recognized and celebrated incompleteness as a normal way of being, not as a negative thing. A thing to, 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 to shy away from, to, to hide under the carpet, but something to celebrate. That humans are incomplete, nature is incomplete, and the supernature is incomplete. What, what mobilizes them to be able to achieve their ends is an emphasis on interconnections and interdependency. Now, I, I thought this template, this, the epistemology offered epistemological possibilities offered by the suggestion of incompleteness as the normal way of being anything is fascinating. It is a, an epistemology uh, of conviviality that in fact seems to succeed, uh, to, to promise far more than the current fixations with binary thinkings, with dichotomies which we find in the academy. In the academy, every discipline, every uh, um, uh, faculty, every uh, uh, methodological or conceptual pretension seems to think that they have all the answers and everyone else falls short. What if we enter the, 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 the idea of knowledge production with the, uh, hu the, the disposition of incompleteness and the humility that entails? knowledge production will become an exercise much more that emphasizes conversation and listening. Not listening to pull down or listening to dismiss, but listening to build on, to enhance, to take along, to understand that no one has the monopoly of insights and we are all interested 
in questions and critical questioning and every question uh, uh, resolve uh, is, serves as a platform for new ways of questioning. So I found Amos Tutuola fascinating in this regard. The world of incompleteness that his books are all about is fascinating. And if uh, a very quick example, I know we don't have much time, but if we, we were to take the uh, one thing that stands out in the palm wine drinkers in Amos Tutuola, which I use a lot to illustrate this point of incompleteness, is, is the story of a man who is reduced to a skull and he lives in a community of skulls without need for any other body parts because they, they are skulls, they get by, they continue with life as usual. And then one day they receive news from a distant land about a very beautiful lady who defies all men and a, self a sense of self-importance in terms of, and she, she turns down every able-bodied person as a suitor. And this call hears that story and he says, a woman who turns down every able-bodied man must want as a husband a man who is out of this world. And he looks at himself and says, I am that man clearly out of this world. But this call, having once been a man, understands the frailties of humans and that humans are led by appearances. Again, that point about appearances and that if only he could bring himself to keep up appearances, he might uh, attract this lady. So he decides in, to embark upon a journey of self-activation through borrowed, borrowing body parts. And he borrows, and if you're borrowing body parts, you borrow the best, <laughs> if you can afford them. So imagine that you are borrowing body parts, you have the best legs, maybe you borrow Cristiano Ronaldo's leg, you have Beyonce's uh, looks, you have all of these people. Let's continue with this idea of beauty. And by the time he's through, He's a truly hand, the most handsome man in the world. And he has, uh, he's, com he's described by Amos Tutuola as the complete gentleman. And he borrows the best sports car, imagine, uh, a Ferrari <laughs> or whatever, and drives into this uh, city or this town where this lady, this impossible lady is. And as soon as she sets eyes on him, Again, setting eyes, appearances. She says, you are my man, even before he has said a word. And she decides to jump into his car and drive off with him. But the man is also not just a complete gentleman in the propped up sense of the word. He is also truly a, an honest man. And he tells her, there is a lot less to me than meets the eye. And she insists, she who sees it knows it. <laughs> so she believes in appearances. The man says, the content may not reflect the appearance. <laughs> and since she insists, he, he takes her on a journey of self-activation. And, and as he's, he's moving, because he's a complete gentleman and doesn't want to live on falsehood, he is ready to pay for the body parts that he had borrowed and to return them to the people because they might need them for other things. It was just a borrowed, hired car, hired body parts. And so he deactivates himself into those, those, those levels until... He, by the time he arrives the community, he's a skull once again. Now, what this story tells us is about we are who we are, not through a certain permanent uh, idea of being, a unified body, a unified, a uniform and predictable form, but through relationships of various kinds, through relationships of debt and indebtedness. 
the fact that we belong to a world that is dynamic, that is mobile, we are open to constantly enriching ourselves, not through zero-sum games, but through uh, 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 enhancements by celebrating our incompleteness. We open ourselves up to be able to, in, uh, to take ourselves out we, by taking uh, the outside in. <laughs> and I think this is a fascinating template for a university. I, 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 a fascinating template where the idea is not university rankings. Whenever UCT finds itself ranked the best in Africa, it celebrates and says, I'm superior to all the others. No, it's a game of circulation and allowing for self-enhancement through important conversations with one another, disabusing ourselves of this superiority syndrome and the zero-sum game approaches to things by just recognizing that incompleteness is a normal way of being. It, it also offers us a fascinating new template for organizing the university. If disciplines like you are from fine art and from sociology and uh, uh, we can find people from engineering, we all recognize that we, what we contribute is incomplete. Nobody has the final answers and therefore uh, inclusivity a sort of Ubuntu knowledge production <laughs> endeavor would make us much more relevant to the society, less elitist, less binary in our approach. We operate within the, a template of completeness and the university is a champion of that template. Once you acquire a degree, you are tall on it and you are supposed to look down on everyone else. Once, and if your degree is from, from UCT, you feel that you are taller than someone from Fort Hare or from University of the North or what, Northwest and whatever. Or if you are from Harvard, if you are from... San, so it, 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 it inflect, inflects itself with a hierarchy of credibility that has no, no, no humility to recognize incompleteness. And the fact that we are who we are through relationships with others and through interdependencies. That particular template is also one where a priori knowledge generated in the South, because a university happens to be in the South, even if, the, if, it's, even if it's the lead university in the world, is immediately positioned in the lower ranks of that, the lower ranks of that hierarchy. That cannot be a meaningful, productive way of generating knowledge, promoting conversations on, on the, uh, in the academy. So my, uh, uh, pro, uh, my, my proposition is for us to break free, to rupture with this narrow framework where incompleteness is overly dramatized, even when the reality is that of incompleteness, because it just creates dictatorships of various kinds or, or in, a, in a, 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 a insensitivities to the predicaments of, 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 of others within that framework. Such a university is one in which incompleteness is embraced and celebrated, that no race has the monopoly of insights, that humanity is a process of being and, 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 and becoming on a constant basis, and that nobody has uh, the, any justification at all to lord it over others, to play God in the lives of, of others, just simply because they are, they are a different race, different class, different uh, gender, different generation. And that knowledge production about a society in its complexity and nuance requires participation by all and sundry in a way that we could truly call participatory.